We met in school. We don't know when. Can't remember. We just have kind of always known each other. It wasn't one of those like lightning bolt moments. Her older siblings and my older siblings were in the same grade, so we just kind of always grew up knowing each other. Growing up, I always wanted to be a dad. I just never realized I was capable of loving as much as that. And so when I became a mom, my whole world was just opened up. What are you doing? I'm playing marbles. You're playing with the marbles? Show me the marbles. Can you sign colors? Colors. Okay, sign red. Sign black. What was unique about Emily is that she lived life in rainbow colors. Everything was bright, everything was loud, and everything was fun. And that embodied her completely. So we joke around that she should be a sports broadcaster because she just constantly is commenting on play everything play. that's at the play. She constantly gave you a play-by-play. -play. But I think what I loved most about her personality was that she was so in tune with everyone around her and what they were feeling. Hey, Emily, tell me what your favorite color is. Pink. Will it ever change? No. It will never be a different color, ever? No. My dad passed away, and we talked a lot about death and dying. And Emily was the oldest, and so those were things that she was very curious about. She wanted to understand, you know, was she going to see her grandpa again? After Emily's grandpa died, and we're having all these really kind of tough conversations and trying to help a six-year-old understand in a way that hadn't really been tested before. And I remember having this conversation about where he is now and talking about the plan of salvation and where we came from. And she was saying how much she misses her grandpa. And then she pauses and she looks at me and she goes, so do you think Heavenly Father misses me since I used to be with him and now I'm down here? And I was like, I guarantee he misses you. The morning was, you know, just kind of like any other morning. We joked around that I never had to set an alarm clock because Emily was very punctual with her alarm clock. We finally had a teacher that she wasn't allowed to come into our room until seven o'clock. I had gotten up and was getting ready for work and I was leaving before seven. Before I left, I just poked my head into her room. She was awake and just sitting on the edge of her bed, obediently waiting for seven o'clock. When I opened the door, she actually, she looked at me and she looked at the clock. And then I just got to go in and just sit down with her and just tell her that I loved her and give her a hug. That wasn't something that I did every morning. It felt normal. Our usual thing was we'd go to the bus stop and, and Emily would get on the bus and we'd wave goodbye. And that morning was the only morning in all the mornings that I took her to the bus stop where she got on the bus and didn't turn and wave goodbye. And I remember feeling so sad and thinking, why did she not wave goodbye? And I thought, oh, it's fine. Just once is okay. I received an automated phone call from our school district informing us that there had been a shooting at one of the schools in Newtown. It was after I called my husband who was at work where he turned on the news that he informed me that it was actually at Sandy Hook Elementary School, the school that my daughter was attending first grade. And so at that point, I remember my heart just dropping because I knew that it was easy for someone to gain access to her classroom when you first enter the school. So my first reaction was just anxiety. And I remember feeling adrenaline just rush throughout my body. And I got in the car and I immediately started towards the school. When I got that phone call, my initial reaction was to think that it was, it was someplace else, that it was at the high school or, or somebody had just done something stupid and there wasn't really a, a big deal. When I approached the school, I remember just being so caught off guard by how many people were there and it was chaotic. My only thought was, what is Emily feeling right now? 
all I kept visualizing was seeing Emily, taking a picture and sending it out to all of our family and friends and saying, she's okay. And then just holding her in my arms and taking her home. I remember trying to just wrap my head around what was going on. And it took hours before it was finally confirmed that Emily um, would not be coming home with us. And it felt impossible. It felt so confusing. She was just with me. I mean, I was just with her. She had been with me every day, her whole life. I had never missed those moments with her. And all of a sudden, it was caught. It was gone. My connection was gone from her. And I remember going to our car because I was in this large conference room with all of these people all day long. I'd not been alone to have, you know, a moment for myself. And I'd been praying all day long that she would be okay. More quiet, just stunned about what had just transpired. And we agreed that we needed to say a prayer. So at that point, Robbie began saying a prayer. And this voice came in my mind and it said, Emily's okay. This vision of Emily being embraced by our savior came into my mind. And it wasn't just her, it was all of those children. And so when I heard those words, Emily's okay, I thought about his loving arms around her and what peace and comfort that brought me because I thought to myself, she's loved, she's not scared, she is being comforted because that's what I wanted to be doing and I couldn't do it. And here, I was given this gift of comfort, knowing that she was around those who loved her. What a miracle. When I said that prayer, the only feeling that I had it was just less than half a second long. And it was just this feeling of, I know. I'm aware of what is happening and I know what's going on and I'm, and I'm here, I know. And I felt this almost like flicker of hope before everything just started crashing back down around me again. And looking back again, I can see how important that, that glimmer of hope was because I knew I had something that in the days going forward in the weeks and months that were so dark and painful that we had something that I could point back to and look at. The day after Emily died, I received a message that simply said, so where was your God yesterday at 9.30 in the morning? The feeling that I had in that moment was God was right where he needed to be, that God was there with those children, comforting those children, and giving them the peace of mind that they were in a better place, and that God was right where He needed to be. And He was with me, and He was with my daughter, and He was with those other kids and with their families. And to everybody that allowed that event to open up their heart, or to soften their heart a little bit, He was there for them too. That's where He was. You know, as a mother, I rely on the Spirit to prompt me on how to protect my children. I can't tell you the number of times that I've prevented them from hurting themselves or prevented them from an experience that, that would have been harmful to them because I rely so much on that intuition and the partnership. And I think the hardest thing for me was coming to terms with my failure as a mom to not protect my child. I was given this beautiful angel to protect. And that day, I felt nothing to prevent me from sending her off to school. And it takes a long time to understand what the bigger picture is. That moment, as painful and as terrible as it is, does not define my family. And it did not disconnect me from her forever. You can't look around this earth or look up at the stars at night and not understand that you're witnessing a power that is beyond your ability to comprehend. And 
through this life, Heavenly Father gives us experiences where we get to see that. And they're short and they might be fleeting, but He gives us an opportunity to see His plan in action. And that has been such a miraculous thing for me to witness and to feel and to bring into my life. That His plan for me and for my family is ongoing and it is a work in progress and that He has committed Himself to me and is asking for me to commit myself to Him. So we had this experience with the girls. I was reading them this bedtime story about fairy tales. And when I was talking to my girls about happily ever afters, I asked them, in fairy tales, someone almost always dies. What does that look like to you guys? Samantha said, oh my gosh, mom, we're just like them in the story. We had someone in our family die and we have a happily ever after. And that was when I asked her, why do you think we have a happily ever after? And I remember she actually looked at me kind of like, Mom, how do you not know? She goes, because we're happy. And that was just a learning moment for me that we don't have to overcomplicate it. That if we find those moments to let that happiness in. And for me, that is a miracle. A miracle is not a life without pain. A miracle is learning to deal with the pain and finding the happiness with the pain. When I hear people talk about, do miracles still exist today? I think about all of the amazing moments that we have felt our daughter and that we have felt connected to her. And those small little miracles provide me with the insight that they do exist. We think of miracles as being grand and being large and overt, and they're not. They can be, but we're missing out seeing the rest. And I think that for me, this experience has taught me to slow down and see all of those beautiful things, all those miracles that are around us that we take for granted. While it is good to pray for and work for physical protection and healing during our mortal existence, our supreme focus should be on the spiritual miracles that are available to all of God's children.